Is it? Oh, we're two minutes past. We are two minutes past because it's 9.36, not 9.34 is when we start adult ed. Thank you so much for returning um, for the third session uh, for Sandy Prouty's class on art and images. Everyone has been raving about this series, correct? Watching online and, and um, here in person. So again, Sandy Prouty, you are the best. We are so grateful for you in so many ways. Um, thank you for being here for the third in your session on this theme of wilderness. Um, just want to give a plug for, I don't have my heels on today. Look at me, I don't have my flats on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, my husband, Timothy Beale, who is a, a religion professor, biblical studies, will be leading a two-week series starting next week on um, G called the Cinematic Gospels, so Jesus in Cinema, um, the end of his journey uh, toward the cross. So I hope you come for the next two weeks. Um, he'll be doing that, and it'll be great. All right, Sandy, thank you. Thank you. you Thank you. Uh, well, it's so wonderful to be with you uh, here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us online. This is the third presentation on wilderness art. Today we'll be looking more completely at our own personal Lenten experience in this year of 2022. We'll be looking at scripture. I have a poem to share. And we'll be looking at pieces of art from the 20th century mainly, although there will be a few that are older and a few that are present day. I wanted to begin today by backing up to last week's session and considering this painting again. This is The Last Supper done by Lorna May Wadsworth, a British artist. And there was a question about where Judas is in this picture. Judas is seated, he's third to the left from our Jesus who is standing. He's sitting there looking very sheepish. This painting was installed at St. Albans Cathedral. It's a cathedral that was started to be built in 1077 and finished in 1877. It's part of the cathedral movement of Europe and construction outlived many builders and architects but for that conservative space to hold this artwork is quite phenomenal. You know, copies of this piece have been displayed in other churches. When it was in Gloucester, England, it was vandalized. Someone actually sh shot through it in several places. Um, someone who could not abide the idea of a black Jesus. But let's begin today. We're returning to an image from the very first session. This was done by Russian artist Ivan Kromskoy. We talked at that time that this is an image for our own personal Lenten practice. Jesus in the wilderness, by himself at a threshold time of day. It looks like dawn to me, that liminal space. He's sitting in quiet, serious contemplation and prayer. So we'll hold this image as we work through the presentation today. This is such a similar view of a more modern day person. This is called April Wind. It was painted in 1952 by Andrew Wyeth, who is one of the most well-known American artists of the 20th century. Here we see 
a single figure alone seems to be contemplating. But in true Andrew Wyeth style, we don't see his face. So often he painted people walking away from us or turning away from us, either in part or in full. This piece is in the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, Connecticut. Andrew Wyeth lived from 1917 to 2009. He painted realism and regionalism. He showed us the land, the buildings, the people where he lived in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, and on the Maine coast. April wind. His most well-known painting is Christina's World. This was a portrait of a neighbor in Maine. The story is that Anna Christina Olson suffered from a degenerative muscular disease, maybe polio, but she refused to use a wheelchair. So she made her way from place to place like this. Andrew Wyeth painted this in 1948. It's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. There's a sense of grieving and melancholy in this work. And that echoes through many of the paintings of Andrew Wyeth that came after 1945. In 1945, his father, who was also a well-known artist, N.C. Wyeth, and one of Andrew's cousins, were both killed at a railroad crossing near their home. And you can almost sense that loss and grief in his paintings. I'd like to show you just another one of the Maine coast. This is called Baleen. He painted it in 1982. Again, a solitary figure turned away from us, looking out at God's creation. Another artist who wanted to paint loneliness, urban loneliness and disappointment, is Edward Hopper. He lived from 1885 to 1967. He is known for his treatment of light. This is office in a small city he painted it in 1953, again hoping to show how lonely cities can be. You know, through our Lenten frame, we could see this instead as a moment of spiritual practice during Lent, a moment where you carved out a time to pray or consider your relationship with God's way of love. This is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, Edward Hopper. He painted Automat in 1927, again trying to show us loneliness but I see an opportunity to be alone and have a time to consider our place in the world of God, our relationship to the stories of Jesus, our remembering of what Jesus actually said. This is in the Des Moines, Iowa Art Center. Hopper's most famous work is this one. 
It's called Nighthawks. In it, he captures the inner city after hours solitude of the people who are moving to a lighted space, but still, still seem quite solitary. He painted this in 1942, during World War II. It's at the Art Institute in Chicago. You know, as we consider Lent 2022, it may feel like this work, which is entitled Falling Up by Ken Varna. Everywhere we turn, there is a concern, and we've been through two years of upheaval and concern. He's a it's a very simple technique here of size to create depth. Very large shoes. Those in the back that are falling are very tiny. Ken Varna was abandoned at birth and adopted by a family that spent most of their time in the Hamptons. So he lived in a high society circle. He was exposed to famous artists like de Kooningberg and Andy Warhol. He went to the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. He also wrote a novel called Free Falling, and it has been thought to be his story of the mental illness he has struggled with all his life. He did free falling in 1964, and he is still living. Another image I love for this past two years and for every day of Lent. I don't have a credit for this, it was a bulletin cover years ago, and I think Ian chose it. So I have copied it, I've framed it. It's everywhere I go, this picture goes. The courage of that little bird to just jump off the ledge, wings back, head first. It also reminds me of a mural that you can see on Market Street in Denver. It's between Downing and Park Avenue, and it simply says in black and white, nothing without courage. So as we think about a Lenten practice this year, we can return to some of the words of Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are the poor, the meek, those who mourn, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers. I want to show you some images of poverty. This was painted in 1878 by French artist Jules Bastien Lepage. It is a very beautiful, uplifting representation of poverty done in a very French way. Here we see a beautiful young woman, very well dressed for the task. We see a woman behind her smiling. We see a beautiful countryside. And we see so many potatoes. This was of a simpler day when there was actually a social contract that allowed the hungry and the poor to be gleaners and pick up what was left after the harvest a simple and effective way to do God's work in this world of feeding the hungry. This painting is in the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. A 
another view of poverty, of American poverty, was painted by black artist Henry Osana Tanner. He lived from 1859 to 1937. He began painting in Pennsylvania and gained a claim that sent him off to Paris, where he lived for the remainder of his life. This is a very realistic and poignant scene of poverty. We see a frayed tablecloth, a table of empty plates, and we see a grandfather and a grandson giving thanks. The thankful poor dates to 1894. The expression on that child says so much about the desperation they are feeling and they are giving thanks. This piece is owned by Art Bridges, which is an art lending nonprofit. Another black artist named Jacob Armstead Lawrence painted this scene. It's entitled, They Were Very Poor. It's part of a series of 60 panels that Lawrence painted. The series is called The Great Migration, and it chronicles the movement of black Americans from the south to the north during World War II as they hoped for employment. He painted this series between 1940 and 1941. He calls his technique dynamic cubism. Cubism was pioneered by Pablo Picasso and George Brock as a simplification of nearly anything, including human faces and musical instruments into geometric shapes that they sometimes then rearranged. In this artist's painting, we see a simplification to geometric shapes, shapes of black and brown contrasted with shapes of vivid color. Again, they seem to be giving thanks, having a moment of sharing a grace They were very poor. This entire series is jointly owned by the Museum of Modern Art and the Phillips Collection of Washington, D.C. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Here's another view of poverty done by an artist who I mentioned in the presentation last week. This was created by Jean-Michel Basquiat. He was a Puerto Rican Haitian artist who spent his time in New York City. There's a wonderful children's book written about him. It's called Radiant Child. It was done by Javica Steptoe. It won the Caldecott Award for any of you who know that's the award given to the best picture book of the year. Jean-Michel painted in a very frenzied, 
tormented way from the time he was a child. The book shares that he was drawing and painting on every surface, every piece of paper he could scrounge and find, every wall of the apartment. And then he finally moved out and painted on the walls of the streets of Lower Manhattan. He was painting a statement of the relationship between poverty and power. You can see in the background, it appears to be charts and analysis of some sort, which he completely discounts by a skull-like figure overlaying it, saying to us in image, it doesn't apply to the people who are poor. Your charts about cost-benefit analysis do not apply to the people who are poor. He was born in 1960. He died of a heroin overdose in 1988. He gained great acclaim during that short lifetime. Now I'm moving to a modern day artist. His name is James Early. He was called early in his career to paint the homeless and everyone he talked to tried to talk him out of it, saying there is no money in that, it's a waste of your talent, just don't do that. But he followed what he considered a call. He has painted the homeless in Spain, France, England, Holland, and America. This is Matthew. James Early gets to know people who are experiencing homelessness. He very respectfully asks if he can take their picture, and he paints a portrait from that. I love this young man's face. We can read so many feelings into that face and his circumstance. This is another work by James Early. It's called Stop and Cross. It looks so familiar to many of our travels here in the city of Denver. We see people maybe with a pet, with their possessions in a bicycle or a shopping cart. They are on the move, sometimes by choice and other times by edict. A man who is honored by having his portrait painted by James Early. This sculpture is called Homeless Jesus. It was done by a Canadian artist named Timothy Schmalz. He's a devout Catholic. He did this in 1969 and it has been installed in many places, including St. Peter's Basilica. Brokenness and broken heartedness cast in bronze.
You know, Jesus also said, blessed are the meek. And when I think of the meek of our time, I think of the people who are hiding away, maybe because of addiction, maybe because of racism or discrimination against them. I think of our LGBTQIA plus brothers and sisters and families with pronouns of all sorts who are in danger. Starting with addiction, as the representation of the meek who are blessed. This was done by Keith Negley, showing the truth about the disease of addiction that is so hard for us to comprehend. It is a snake that takes over your life and puts you on your back and may cause you to meekly hide away. This is a work by Lucy Jones. It went with an article in the New York Times. This young woman is gay, and she has had to come out to her grandmother repeatedly because her grandmother has Alzheimer's and she keeps forgetting. So this young woman comes out to her grandmother again. I love that they're walking arm in arm, trying to understand each other. It portrays to me also the meekness of mental illness or dementia or Alzheimer's and shows how much we need each other and how blessed are the meek. Jesus also said, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers. Henry Nouwen said, we're all broken. All who Jesus said were blessed are broken. And our brokenness has no other beauty but the beauty that comes from the compassion that surrounds us. And it, Henry Nouwen, a beloved theologian and author. An image of compassion was done by Vincent van Gogh in 1890. This is his Good Samaritan done in his typical style with texture coming from the thick paint he used called impasto, his use of lots of yellow, a favorite color of his. He lived from 1853 to 1890. He painted this just a few months before his death He painted it while he was in the asylum. On the faces of the helper and the one so desperately needing help, I sense the truth about compassion and acting on it. the gift of being able to do something for someone who needs everything and you just happen to be there with them in a moment and you can do something even small. So often I've heard people ask 
have asked a desperate person who's homeless or mentally ill or addicted, living on the city streets, what do they want? What do they want most? And so often the answer is, they want you to say hello and ask them what their name is. If we can't do what the Good Samaritan did, we can at least see them and let them know that they are seen by us. And we do not agree with the situation they are in and have been put in by a society who turns away from them. It also helps us to think about a time when we really needed someone and that someone came. And it is so hard to capture that expression of total gratitude, unbelievable gratitude that someone chose to help you. And that's what I see on this face of the wounded man. As we think about our Lenten practice, thinking about all who are broken and our possibilities to be merciful, to be compassionate, could be a part of how we spend our time in prayer and contemplation. And blessed are the peacemakers. This piece was done by Dame Laura Knight, a British artist. She earned the title of Dame, being one of the first women to be given a full membership into the Royal Society of England. She was a war artist during World War II, painting very real realistic and detailed works around the activities of the troops she was embedded with. After the war, she volunteered to go to Nuremberg and paint around the trials. She unveiled this work in 1946 to strong opinions, both positive and negative. Many were upset that she hadn't stuck to her usual realism. She said she couldn't sit in that courtroom and deny that the city around it had been completely destroyed by the war. So she eliminated the back wall of the courtroom and showed us the city beyond the wall. It's so reminiscent of images we're seeing now. War always looks the same. The Nuremberg Trials, 1946, Dame Laura Knight. Franz Marc was a German artist. He lived from 1880 to 1916. He was an expressionist and he challenged why things have to be the colors that they are. Why couldn't horses be blue? There's a wonderful children's book about him also. It's called The Artist Who Painted a Blue Horse. It was done by Eric Carle, and I think it would be good for all adults to read too. It just opens up the idea of color. Why couldn't a lobster be yellow? Why couldn't a horse be blue? Franz Marc did several paintings of blue horses, 
before he died. He was killed in World War I. Mary Oliver released a collection of poems in 2014 called Blue Horses. This is one of the works of Franz Mark on the cover, and she wrote this poem about her engagement with one of his paintings, Franz Mark's Blue Horses. I step into the painting of the four blue horses. I am not even surprised that I can do this. One of the horses walks toward me, his blue nose noses me lightly. I put my arm over his blue mane, not holding on, just commingling. He allows me my pleasure. Franz Mark died a young man, shrapnel in his brain. I would rather die than try to explain to the blue horses what war is. They would either faint in horror or simply find it impossible to believe. I do not know how to thank you, Franz Mark. Maybe our world will grow kinder eventually. Maybe the desire to make something beautiful is the peace of God that is inside each of us. Now all four horses have come closer are bending their faces toward me as if they have secrets to tell. I don't expect them to speak, and they don't. If being so beautiful isn't enough, what could they possibly say? He died at age 26. such an impossible-to-believe loss. I know as we consider Lent and our lives now in a more general sense, it feels a bit like this. This is called Everyone is Carrying Stuff. It's by an artist from Provo, Utah, Brian Kershiznik. In the light of these times where in every direction there seems to be something that is uncertain heavy. We find so many calls for compassion and calls for us to decide how we will live in faith. This painting dates back to 1942. It was painted by John Rogers Cox. He lived from 1915 to 1970. It's called Gray and Gold. He was also a regionalist. He painted what he saw in Indiana and Kentucky. He calls his style magical realism. It's real, but it's all cleaned up. We see a very straight crossroads. We see power poles, one point perspective going off into the distance. We could almost imagine ourselves standing at this crossroads. Although it represents a simpler time when the roads that were crossing weren't paved and the power poles were much different from now, but crops were growing. 
there was life and beauty and an ominous, dense storm cloud on the horizon. This was painted 80 years ago, and I feel just as people in the 40s, we can be standing at that crossroad. How do we make our choices? How do we find a way to live in God's way, to remember we are children of God, called to remember who Jesus said was blessed, the poor, the sick, the meek, those who are mourning. How do we decide? I think it can be very clear in the words of Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Familiar words from the Gospel of Matthew. words recorded from so long ago that speak to us directly in this moment. A final image. This is called Star Woman, again by Brian Kershiznik. I think at the crossroads we choose to remember that we all live in houses filled with blessings. We live in houses filled with stars as the night sky. God adds to our blessings and calls us in the life and lessons of Jesus to take a few and share them. So while we spend time in our spiritual practice of Lent, may we remember this is what we have and this is who we are. And Jesus told us what to do with these blessings. Amen. Do you want a time? It, is there time? We got a little bit of a late start. Okay. If, does anyone have a comment or a question or something that came? to your heart or to your um, thinking as we
looked at images today. Yes, I'll, I'll try to pronounce it. It's Brian Kershiz Nick. <laughs> I know. And I have said it all kinds of different ways as I've practiced, and I thought, I just have to get this right. But um, yes, his, his work, both Star Woman and that everyone is carrying stuff, are available through Artful Home. and. I have both of these. That's why I feel comfortable sharing them with you. Yes. Vanessa. Sandy, I'm feeling really grateful for the time and the study and the thoughtful reflection that went into the preparation of this. And I just feel really enriched by the gift of getting to see this art, but also um, sort of held in the container of your theological thoughtfulness. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's been wonderful, as I said, to, to be with you um, these three times, and I'm looking so forward to Tim's presentation on cinema, so. We'll meet again, same time, same place, next week. Thank you, Sandy. We, on behalf of the adult faith formation team here, just forever grateful. We always love when you can share your gifts with the congregation. So thank you, thank you. I love when they ask me. <laughs> I wonder what Lent will look like.